Okay, so again, welcome to Math 127. I'm gonna first start off with pulling up your syllabus and I'm hoping first that everyone received my email from Sunday. Um, and, and I just tried to give you a quick rundown of here's some links, here's some things to do. And I'm gonna go over all that today to, today to make sure everyone's on the same page here. So let me pull up first, let's start with the syllabus. In fact, before that, I'm going to go into Canvas and just show you guys what I'm talking about in terms of CSN Canvas. Um, as you may have seen, we're not required to use Canvas in this course, um, but it's a starting point if anybody has something that they are not, you know, they're not sure where to go or where to find something. It, it is a kind of a a uh, backup plan if you're not sure where to go here. So let me share my screen and see if this will work. Okay, so what I have on the screen here is basically what you guys would see when you go into Canvas. Now, obviously, yours is going to be a little different than mine. I got a lot more things there, but you guys are, I believe, Math 127, Section 1007 right here. And when you go in here, this is a lot of this is what you, you saw in my email yesterday. Um, obviously, you either got my email or you have uh, read this because you are seeing, you know, you're able to make it to the meeting. Now, this link here, let me scroll down to the meeting right here. This meeting link, this is going to be the link every single Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So you just, you don't have to get a new one every single time. This is the same link that should work every time. Um, if you click the link, you won't need the meeting number, the password, all that stuff. Sometimes if you're using another device or another method, you might have that, but really the link is all you should need here and, and you'll get to where I am right now. Um, and again, worst case, there's some phone numbers down here. If you know, you're you're in a place where you can't get internet, at least you can call in and you can listen to what I'm saying. It's it's not as good as watching, obviously, because it's math, but something is better than nothing. So that that's always going to also be the option there. So let me jump right to the syllabus here. So if you click that link, it should take you to the syllabus. And we're just going to go over this and, and talk about what's happening here. So, so we're clear. We're an eight-week course right here, June 6th, starting today, ending all the way to the end of July. Now, I think July 31st is a Sunday. I think our final is due on, I forget if I made it Friday or Saturday, but that's the official dates of the semester that we're dealing with. We're meeting Monday, Wednesday, Friday, as I said, 12 to 150 here in this, this WebEx chat room. Um, if you need to reach me, email is the best way. In fact, that's the only way. Reach out to me on email. Obviously, I'll answer questions during our classes every day and, and feel free to speak up at any time. But outside of class, if you send me a message in Canvas, I don't check that on a regular basis. If you send it through my math lab, also, it's something that isn't always checked. The email right here is what I always check, and this is where you'll get the quickest response. Uh, my office is at the West Charleston campus in the C building, room 250A. I'm there in and out all the time in the summer, but I don't have official office hours. But if you needed to meet up in person and go over some of these problems or if you have any questions, um, I can be there by appointment. So reach out to me, shoot me an email, and I can try to make a, a time that, that'll work for both of us. So first thing here, we're going to look at your course ID. We're going to go into My Math Lab. That's where everything's going to be. So I'm going to take you to this link in a bit where... If you have not already signed up for my math lab, we're going to get into that in a bit. So hold tight on that one. And, and while we're, when we get to that, I encourage you, if you haven't done this, do this while we're talking. You know, I'm going to show you the link and I want you to click the same thing, sort of mirror what I'm doing and, and sign up because you need to be signed up literally today. So important dates, there's not a whole lot here. A couple days from now, you get your final date to get a refund, 50% refund. The July 11th is the big one when to drop a class where you're going to get a W. And I always put that in there because if for whatever reason you're having trouble, you're failing, something went wrong, and you need to drop the class, it has to be done by this date right here. Okay, after July 11th, if you try to drop, you won't be allowed to, and then I, you will be on my final roster, and I am forced to give you a grade. I cannot give you a W. So I have to give you a grade, and usually if you want to drop, it's because your grade is not great. So... Keep that in mind. If something's going wrong, you you need to drop the course by that date. After that, you're going to get an F or a D or whatever the you know the grade was that you earned. 
And when I say drop the class, that means do not email me and say I want to drop. You have to actually go in through, log in my CSN, go in there, drop the class, make sure you're out of it. And, and you know, I don't want anyone to do that. But if you have to, what I always say is make sure you get a confirmation that says she's dropped. Take a screenshot of that just in case, just because if you come back on July 12th and you say I already dropped and I don't see a record, the registrar doesn't see a record, they're going to make you get a grade here. So keep that in mind. Um, the final exam is due on Friday, July 29th, the, pretty much our last day. Um, we'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, meetings take place three times a week. Let me fix that as listed in our course catalog here. And again, just as we're talking about right now, in addition to these classes, we're going to be using my math lab, which is where your homework, your quizzes, your exam, everything will take place in my math lab. So it's meeting online through WebEx and it's doing all the work in my math lab. So if you've ever had a Pearson, my math lab or any kind of Pearson course, you should be familiar with this. Um, if you've not done that before, you know, it, it's it's not a difficult thing to learn, but it, you, it, it's going to take a day or two just to kind of navigate through things. But it's not much different than Canvas. Good and bad things are in it. Um, first thing, once you get logged in, you're going to have to take a syllabus quiz. And I saw a few of you already took it and passed it. And that is just to make sure that you're aware of how the class works and you're you're following the syllabus, you know the rules of the course. It's, it's mainly to make sure you know the important stuff. Once you pass that syllabus quiz, then it opens up your homework, different homework assignments, and then the homework assignments open up a quiz. So I'll show you the schedule down here in a bit as well so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, move down a little bit here. There are computer labs open on campus. You have that ability. You're more than welcome to use those all the time for this if you're already in there now or if you want to meet, um, you know, if you want to log in for the WebEx meetings, you can always use the computer labs. There's, you know, on all three campuses, they are open and available. So course objectives and goals, I won't read them all. I, I, you can read these later on, but we are pretty much the second pre-calculus course. We're going to cover a lot of trigonometry this semester. If you've not ever had that before, you're going to learn it. I'm going to pretend no one's ever seen it. A lot of this stuff, we're going to go brand new. Um, my goal, though, I'll tell you, my, my, my course objective and goal is I want you all ready for Calc 1. When you take it, if it's in the fall or the spring or anytime in the future, if that's your, your end goal, I want you to be ready for it. So a lot of the things I emphasize in this course are things that I know are important in calculus, 1, 2, and 3, whatever you have to take. And there will be some, some topics that you're going to see. I'm just going to skim through. They're not as important because simply they're not important in calculus. So we'll cover them, but that'll be about it. But lots of trigonometry and it's, it's geometry based, if you didn't know that. And, you know, a lot of visual stuff, a lot of calculations as well. And we're still going to do lots of algebra in here as well. So calculators, obviously this is a remote, remote class, so you can use a calculator. I encourage you to use one, at least a scientific calculator. I'm wary about you using a, uh, graphing calculator, I can't stop you. And I'm going to show you a lot of problems how to use a graphing calculator, or I'm going to go to a website and show you how to use a graphing calculator. Be aware though that yes, you can use it on the final exam. You can use it on the quizzes. Don't get too reliant on it because I don't know how your calc teacher is going to be next semester. You know, if you're in an in-person class or, or they have, you know, that proctor you and they say no calculators, I, I don't want you to get so reliant on this that you can't function in the future. So I'm going to show you both ways. I, I want to. I want you to know how to do the problems with and without a calculator, so that you are ready for anything in the future. Um, if you have any kind of a, a reasonable accommodation that you feel you need, it has to go through the uh, Disability Resource Center. I can't give you anything unless it's through them. So reach out to them, and they will reach out to me. Um, on a, uh, academic dishonesty, obviously, won't be tolerated. Something that I'm looking for. Uh, miss quiz and exams. I'm very tight on this. We have deadlines and you'll see our quizzes are due every Monday and Wednesday. We have two quizzes a week. You're going to have eight to 10 days prior to do every single one of these quizzes. So there are no real excuses for missing a quiz. You just have to get it done on time. If you wait to the last minute and tech things happen or internet issues happen, that's something that's going to be on you. And, and my, my answer always is, is you don't wait to the last minute. So We'll talk again about that, how it works, but every quiz is due. There are no exceptions. There are no, you know, if, if you email me and say, can I get a little more time? The answer is always going to be no. So don't even bother on that one here. 
Um, I do drop your lowest quiz. You're gonna see we have 15 quizzes, I believe, and I do drop your lowest one. So if you miss one, it's not the end of the world. So just keep that in mind, but obviously try to take all of these as well. Um, so there's a study plan that's part of my math lab that you'll see. It is optional. It's just something to give you extra work, okay? Some students use this, a lot of students do not because there's plenty of work in the homework, especially for a summer class. There's gonna be a lot of homework here. Um, every single quiz, so again, I told you we have two a week. The quizzes cover one to three sections and there's a corresponding homework for every single quiz. And that's the, the kind of stuff that I'm gonna be doing in class is going over the homework, going over the quizzes, getting you ready for those each week. So. Essentially, you have to show that you can do the work by doing the homework. You do the enough problems in my math lab, you get enough right, you then qualify for the quiz, and then you take the quiz and you get your score. And that's what counts. The homework is actually not part of your final grade, but it's required to open up the quizzes, and the quizzes are what count. So I told you there's 15 20 point quizzes. I drop your lowest one, so I count your best 14. And then at the end, there's one final exam, it's worth 100 points. So you can kind of do the math and you'll see in, in, in a second here, there's 280 points for all the quizzes, 100 points for the final. The lion's share of this class is gonna be the, the quizzes, okay? It's, it's almost 75% of your grade is a quizzes, whereas your final's uh, 26, 27%, something like that. It's still significant, but you're gonna earn your grade based on what you get on these quizzes. So these quizzes that you take every week or two, or one or two a week, those are gonna be what matters when, you, when you're doing this class. Okay, so the key right here, all these tips for success, you can read these later on, but the main one is don't procrastinate, all right? If you wait until Friday, or, you know, and you'll see me go over this, our first quiz is due on Friday, Friday night at 10 o'clock, all right? When you do that, like I said, you can't just show up at 9.30 and say, oh, I gotta do the quiz and turn it on, because as I mentioned earlier, the first thing it's gonna say is, did you do the homework? Oh, he didn't do the homework. Now I got to do the homework. I have to get a 90% on the homework. And then the quiz opens up. So if you wait to start the homework, trust me, you're never going to finish it. The homeworks do take a couple of hours at least to complete. So you have to put in that time and you cannot try to do it all on Friday. I guarantee it. I like math, but even I can't do that much in a row and, and be functional. You have to spread this out. My recommendation is do 30 minutes or an hour a day every single day and then you'll knock that homework down you'll start knocking away those problems and then all of a sudden you'll be at the end and you'll have the the minimum score and you can do the quiz no problem okay you also don't want to wait to the last minute as i said because if there's a tech issue or something goes wrong with your computer or whatever the case you don't want to have to deal with that with minutes to go before the deadline you want to have time to fix a problem you know like i said if your internet goes out and it's 9 30 you're not going to get to do this if you try this at noon and your internet goes out, well, then you can either wait it out or you can go somewhere else. You can go, you know, go to school, go to another place, and then you can get the, uh, you know, the, the quiz completed in time. So the main one, don't procrastinate. Um, ask for help. We have great tutorial services. They even do remote uh, tutoring if you need help or you can go in in person. You, of course, can always email me or I expect you to ask me questions each class if something's not clear. Um, but you have resources. You have a lot of them out there. Don't be afraid to use them. You know, don't let your pride get in the way and say, oh, I don't want to use, I don't want help. I can do this on my own. I'm sure you can, but it won't hurt to have the help. So please do that because it's, it's only going to make your grade better here. All right. Um, let's go over the, our, our eight week schedules you see here at the bottom of the syllabus. So you see the first thing we're going to do is this week, week one, we're covering, I want you to do the syllabus quiz. I want you to do section 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, and these are your two quizzes. So your first quiz, I told you is due on Friday, it's on section 6.1. So what that means is, before Friday, hopefully today, you have to do that syllabus quiz. Once you get the syllabus quiz done, then you can do, start the homework on section 6.1, and you'll see me dive into that a little bit today. And you can see there's a number of problems, but it's, it's gonna take some time here to do. So you have to get them done and then you'll be able to take the quiz and then the cycle starts over. Then you have to do sections 6.2 and 6.3 and then once those home, that homework is done, then you can take the quiz which is on section 6.2 and 6.3. And you see, 
two quizzes a week all the way through the end. Um, and there's one quiz on the final week and your final. I did put, I'm going to let you go to the 30th. So I'll give you an extra day on that one just so you're not doing everything on that Friday. But you have to complete your final exam. All right. So we're covering five chapters, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, And this is the breakdown of what we're doing. And like I said, usually it's one to two, usually about two sections, sometimes one every time we have a quiz. Some are easy, some are difficult, some take a lot of work. The, the general rule, and, I, and I'll say this with quotes, in a normal semester, you're supposed to spend twice as much time studying as you spend in the classroom. So keep this in mind. We meet twice, three times a week, six hours, or two hours a day. So we meet six hours a week. Theoretically, besides the six hours that we're putting in here on WebEx, you're supposed to spend 12 hours a week doing this math. Okay, so you break that down. That's an hour and a half, two hours a day, give or take. That's what you need to commit to this class. It does take time. Now, is it going to be that much? No, it's not going to be 12 hours every week. Some weeks are going to be less. Some weeks might even be a little bit more, but usually it's going to be less. I just say that, though, so that you are ready because to know that you have to put in work. And this is for any class, not just a math class. Any class that you're taking, you're expected to put in double the amount of time outside of the classroom as you're putting on the, you know, in the classroom here. So a lot of time, you know, I've seen that the reason students fail in online courses, they wait until the deadline, like I said, procrastinate the last minute, and then it gets, they get caught, they just get caught. I would suggest if possible, treat this like a regular class, if you're meeting here in person, or set some time every day like a work schedule, like a meeting schedule, like a therapy schedule, whatever it is, and say, you know what, from five to six every night, I'm going to put everything down and I'm going to put on my calendar. I'm going to spend time on this, this class. Even if it's one hour, at least you're, you're committing to some and you're going to get things done and you can get going, but you can't do it all at once. And, and that's the big message I'm trying to get to you all. Okay, so based on the syllabus, does anybody have any questions? And I, I meant to tell you just to cut in any time. You don't have to wait for me to ask questions, but... Anything on this syllabus that you're not sure of or the course, the grading, any of this? Okay, don't be shy. Um, as I start lecturing in a bit uh, or I go through the My Math Lab stuff, anytime, just, just yell out if you guys have a question in, in the class here. So don't be afraid to do that. All right, so let me move over to... Back to the, the canvas here. You can see where I'm at here. Um, the, if you have not already done this, the student registration handout is what you need to click. <clears throat> this is where you figure out how to get into it. It's just a one page right here and you want to click this link and it's going to ask you to create an account and I may already be logged in. Okay. So if you have not created an account, you create one here. If you already have one, you can log in here. And if you want, and then when you go in here, and I can't because I am I got the instructor access, so I'm not going to show it. But when you get in, there's a registration point where, okay, you log in and it's going to tell you what's the course. So let me see if I can try to remember if I have an old password or something else I can use. But what matters is this right here. See that course right there? That's the one. When you click that link, it's going to take you to this course. So once you get going, it's going to ask you, okay, do you have an access code, you know, an access? This is the course ID. It's not the access. The access is like a 16 digit number. So if you purchase this, um, my math lab, this is the requirement for the course. Remember, you do not have to buy a book. You have to purchase an access code to my math lab. If you've already purchased it at the bookstore and you open it up, you're going to see there's like a 16 digit code inside. Okay. And that's what you enter with the part where it says, you know, do, are you able to pay now? If you didn't purchase that, it's actually cheaper if you just go buy it online. If you drop a credit card in here and you can buy it, it's $95, $100. It's around there. That's what you have to purchase there. So either you buy it in the bookstore or you buy it directly through Pearson. Either way, that's what you have to do. Now, if you're not able to buy it right now, understandable, you have an option where you can get a temporary access. And to find where that went. They mentioned it on that page. Okay, let's go back. So on the student registration handout, you see right here, you, you, you create your account and then they ask you, 
what's your access here? If you have the access code from the bookstore, there it is, or you can buy it right now, or there's this option. So every single one of you, if you have paid, if, even if you can't pay today, you should click this one, get temporary access without payment for 14 days. So that allows you to start the course today, to start the syllabus quiz, to start the homework, to get going on the quiz, because say you're waiting for a paycheck to come in next Monday, and then you can buy the course, that's fine, but you've missed a whole week of the, of the material. You've missed a quiz. You've missed homework. You've missed a lot. This allows you to get rolling immediately. And that's why I need everyone to get signed up and to do this. So again, go into Canvas. Click right here. This instructions. Click that. It gets you right in. And then you're, this is the course we're going to be in. Okay. So let me show you how it looks from... I had it here a second ago. Give me a second. Okay, so when you get into Pearson, once you log in, you're going to see my courses. Okay, now if you have, most of you only have one, this one right here, this Math 127, that's where you're going to enter. All right, and I see, let me go back and just see that there are, yeah, 28 people. I've got about 90 students in here, so don't worry if you haven't got in. There's a lot of people haven't got in, but hopefully today you get in. So when you join, yours is going to look slightly different than mine because of what's going on here, but the assignments is where I'm going to tell you go right to, all right? And you're going to see the things. Now, I don't have everything showing because I don't want everyone doing everything at once. You'll see the syllabus quiz. You'll see homeworks. And when you see these little green flags, that means you haven't met the prerequisite. Like you cannot start homework. If you click it, it tells you, oh yeah, I can't do it until I finish the syllabus quiz. So do the syllabus quiz. And all this is is just some basic things here. Um, you start it up, and you can take this as many times as you need. It's, it's very flexible. So what's your name? What's a phone number you can be reached? And, and all these, by the way, are just to make sure if there's an issue, I have a way to contact you. Um, a lot of times, people have my math lab set up with one name, but their official name at CSN is something different. That's the reason for question number one right there is, you know, there's a John Doe here, but it's listed as something is different. Tell me what your actual CSN name is, and that way our grading book is lined up at the end. So then you have things like, what's the best way to reach me? I well, we went over that earlier. That's my email. Um, is the homework part of your final grade? It's just kind of making sure you, you either watch this video or you showed up to class today, or that you know what's going on in the course. You just, you, you've read the syllabus. It's what's going on. So, um... Okay, and I got to make sure. Make sure you take your final. It can be at home or at work. It used to be at the West Charleston campus, but since COVID's happened, I've, I've changed that. So you shouldn't have to do that. Um, and then no makeups, all that. And this last one I just had to throw in. It doesn't really count for much. Just making sure you can do the basics here. And then you submit it. And if you don't finish it, it'll tell you, oh, you didn't answer them all. And... When it tells you your grade, by the way, don't worry. It might tell you, hey, this one isn't graded, the one with your name and your phone number, and it's waiting for the instructor. Don't worry. Those are not net. You don't need to wait for those. It's all these other questions, three through nine, that matter. As long as you get questions three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine correct, then you're going to be able to move on. If you didn't get them right, if any of these are wrong, you need to take it again, and you can just keep taking this as many times as you need. And once that opens, then you're going to be able to take homework number one. Okay, so that's what's going on there. And then once that's done, then you're going to be able to take quiz one. And you see, if you even try to take quiz one now, it tells me, oh, no, you can't. You need to get a, 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 a you need to finish homework number one. So that's our general procedure. Homework, quiz, homework, quiz, all the way through the end, through all 15 of these. Okay, so to show you a couple things we have here, you have your ebook so if you, you know a lot of you i'm sure are used to ebooks now but if you're not all this is is just it's a pdf of the entire textbook for the entire course it actually has math 126 and 127 in here but it, it's it's all of this just like if you had the book in front of you and then you can scroll into where we are so if you want to look at the book we're doing section 6.1 you can have this open while I'm talking today or while you're watching the video just to kind of get a, a preview of what's going on. Or before you look at the video for 6.2, maybe you want to look through 6.2 and just kind of 
get an idea of what that is all about. So these are all things that you're more than welcome to go into when you're, when you're uh, you know, as, as a resource. Some other things you have here, if you go to this video and resource library, there's a lot of good stuff here. Not everyone likes to use it, but you have to select a chapter. So let's go to sec six one that we're doing right now. And the main thing is, if you click find now, nothing's going to come up. The reason is you didn't check any boxes. So check them all. And then when you click that, you see these are all things for you to look at. Okay, this is the textbook down here. You have these videos, you have a PowerPoint. I'm going to use the PowerPoint in class so that if you ever look at my PowerPoints and you're not sure you want to go back, you can go right to here and you can view the exact same PowerPoints I have. Some interactive ones where you can kind of, you know, manipulate the figures. Uh, these are other videos to prep you. This is some more visualizations. This is an animation. So all kinds of things here. I'll, I'll show you kind of this one. And some have audio, some don't. Converting between radians and degrees. Let's convert between radians and degrees. In part one, we will convert the measures of 45 degrees to radians and then 249. I'm just going to fast forward a little bit. Let's back. begin by choosing the correct procedure. Sorry. So basically that's all this is. It's just kind of somebody else walking. Now this is sort of close to what I'll be doing in class, but it doesn't ever hurt to hear it from another perspective, another voice, another you know way to write it out. So that's what this is. And then again, you have these videos. You know, I'll just play a little bit of one. All right, so we now know that 360 degrees represent minute is going to equal so, two decimal degrees. Like I said, it's just another person recording different lectures for all these things. And it's broken down by topic. So say you get stuck on a topic you know, and you're trying to remember from what we talked about, you don't have to go through everything or the whole video. You can kind of go pick and choose certain things of, oh, yeah, I want to talk about this. Just some some options here for you all. OK, so some and, and, and explore here. Play around this. You have a lot of different things here that you have available to use. OK, any questions on anything else that I've talked about so far? Okay, so for the rest of the class, I'm going to give you a short lecture on section 6.1. And I'm going to kind of draw on the screen a lot. I'm going to draw on the PowerPoint slides. And then we're going to spend some time going over some homework problems so you can get an idea of what these homework you know, uh, problems are all about, what they're asking for, etc. So let me pull up this PowerPoint. Okay, and of course it's not working. Hold on, I gotta share the PowerPoints. Apologies. Okay, let's see if this is working. All right, there we go. Now you guys can see it. Okay, so again, I'm just gonna sort of chat about this while we're doing this and I'm going to draw on the screen a little bit more as well. Okay. So, trig functions, what we're talking about here. So you may have heard of some of these. Some of these are going to be brand new to you. And again, you'll find the way I teach this is I'm going through like you've never seen this. Even if you might have had some of this before, I'm going to Pretend this is brand new for all of you. So these are the objectives we're doing in this first one. We have a lot of different topics. And you're going to find that each class period, um, I may not cover every single problem, every single thing, but I'm going to cover enough to get you rolling, to get you going on this. And then we can always pick up if we're missing something with the next class. So 6.1 has all these things. We're going to go from angle measurements, decimals, degrees, minutes, seconds, lengths, Areas, linear speed, radians, degrees. It sounds like it's a lot, especially if, you, if you're if you looking at the screen and you see, I know none of these words. Don't worry. You will soon. All right? So we're going to talk about a few things now. Two rays. A ray is basically a line with a dot on one end. It goes on forever. Okay? 
array looks something like this just keeps going on with the arrow it's just going on forever that's what i'm talking about when they say array so what's going on is we have two angles two lines that open up to make an angle inside now when you're looking at an angle it's what the opening is right here all right if i can get that that opening right there and you notice it's not like i'm taking out a ruler and I'm measuring it because it doesn't matter how long these lines are doesn't matter, matter where you measure it, it's how open they are. That's what we're talking about when we're doing an angle measurements. Okay, so the initial side is always going to be this one here at the bottom, going to the right, your x-axis, essentially. And the terminal side is basically you're opening this up more and more, and wherever it finishes, that's known as the terminal side. And the angle between them is what we're looking for. So we have the counterclockwise rotation, which is the positive angle. Going backwards, right here, this, it's the same opening, but if you measure back here, it's going to be a whole bigger angle. That's considered a negative angle. And I'll show you what I mean in a second when I get to a blank screen. I can show you. I, I can do it right here. Let's say this right here. Let me go to a regular circle. So if you didn't know, that little wedge right there, there's your 90 degree angle. And I know you've heard that before, whether you've had any geometry or not. That right there is going to be 180. And all the way around a circle, that's your 360 degrees. So if, for example, this opening was, say, 30 degrees, just a small opening, going around, if this is 30, the whole rest of it the other way is 330 back. So the direction you go is going to be positive or negative. If you're going counterclockwise, you're always measuring a positive angle. This is 30 degrees. If I went down here, that's negative 30 degrees. And I'm sorry if that's a little messy. Negative 30 degrees. So when I go all the way around, that is 330 degrees. But because it's going clockwise, it's considered negative 330. Now again, ask me any questions. Anybody's not sure of anything, let me know before I get too many slides down the road here. Talk to me if you're not sure of any of these, these problems. Any questions, anybody? All right. I'm hoping you can still hear me. Let's, oh, let me go to that last one. So another thing is sometimes you can keep going around more and more and more. And that's going to be the weird part about when we're dealing with angle measurements. Like you may be going 30 degrees like this. Again, I'm just making up 30. I can go 30 and I can go another 360 from there. So total, this comes all the way around. It's going to be a 390. I meant to write a 390 here. It's the 360 from one circle plus the 30 more. So basically 30 degrees is the same as 390 degrees 45 degrees is the same as adding 360 to it you can just keep adding 360 again and again and again they're all the same angle because all that matters is where did you finish where is your end spot that's what you're looking for when you're when you're measuring something okay where did that terminal side occur all right uh, I saw that question about rewatching the lectures. Um, I don't like to because I want to encourage people to be in class. If you can't help it and you miss a class, I'll share the link with you. But I generally don't share the lectures. Don't let people watch it again, mainly because I don't. I don't want people to miss class. Now, if you've been in class and you do want to watch it again, let me know. Talk to me, and I, and, and I can work. I can share the link with you if I know you're here. Okay, but email me. That, that's the main thing. We'll talk about that if you want to see the lecture again. All right, angle theta. Now, they use this Greek letter theta. That's always going to be the, not always, but that's generally going to be the letter we use that represents the angle measurement. All right, standard position. Um, they say a rectangular coordinate system. That's your x, y axis. Generally, that middle right here where the angle pivots, that's going to be right at the origin. And like I said, this x-axis is always the initial side. And then where the other side opens, that's the terminal side. Okay, so standard position is just where your theta is. 
is theta positive or negative depends on which direction you went. Okay, same thing we talked about a second ago. So when they say it's in standard position, all that means is it's, it's your, your base at the origin. Everything we're going to deal with is in standard position, so don't get wrapped up on that one here. So where the quadrant, sorry, where the terminal side is, what quadrant is, that's going to tell you a lot. And you've already dealt with these quadrants, so the first, second, third, and the fourth. It's going to have special scenarios. It's like where is a dot located, where is a point located. It's going to tell you a lot about what we're dealing with. Sometimes you get this one where they call it a quadr quadrantal angle. It's where the angle lands right on an axis where it's not either in the first, second, third, or fourth. It's right on it. That happens, and those are special cases as well. But anything, every angle in the fourth quadrant is going to have some common traits. Every angle in the second, it's going to have their own common traits just by the quadrants. Okay, so remember, an entire circle is 360 degrees. So one degree is exactly one three hundred sixtieth. It's one little fraction of it. Now, again, I'm going to go through some of these a little bit faster because I think, I, I hope you've had some of these. 90 degrees, zero degrees. This is zero. It's on the left here. It's also 360. Same thing. Where does it end? A 90 degree angle right here, a fourth of a rotation, and a half with 180 degrees. Now, in the next part, they, they, they'll, they'll have you do some exercises. We're going to do them in the PowerPoint here in, in this presentation, but we want to make sure we can draw each of these in standard position. So we start with a 135. Remember, 90 degrees is right here, so we got to go another 45 over. This is what a 135 degree angle looks like in standard position. Sorry. All right. This is a negative 180. Now remember, 180 is this going over the top, but a negative 180 is going clockwise. It just so happens that they are the same. Same picture in the end, half a revolution. 90 degrees is a quarter going right here. And you're 495. So remember how 495 goes. Well, let's go all the way around once. That's 360. Oops, sorry. And then what's left? Take 360 away from here. We have another 135. So we do another 135. So you see 495 is exact same as that 135 we had earlier. Same exact thing because we just added 360 to it, but they're the same look the same results okay then they have degrees seconds or minutes and seconds you know you you have 360 degrees every degree can be broken up into 60 minutes that's what this single hash is every minute can be broken up into 60 seconds so if you ever hear anybody give a uh, longitude and latitude or a gps measurement you're going to hear degrees minutes and seconds because they're just more specific refined amounts and fractions of a of a, a degree here okay so now some again these are all exercises you're going to see in your homework 65 degrees nine minutes 17 seconds they want to convert this to a decimal in only degrees so here's how it works uh, or sorry let's get to that problem so remember one minute is one sixtieth of a degree one second is one sixtieth of a minute so it's basically 1 over 60 times 1 over 60 of a degree. So this 9 minutes right here is going to be 9 times 1 minute, 17 times 1 second, and then we're going to replace what we had up here. So see this, this 1 minute? We replace it with 1 60th of a degree times 9. This one uh, 17 seconds, we replace the seconds with 1 over 60 times 1 over 60 degrees, and you plug that all into your calculator, add them up, and that's your specific measurement. So in 65 degrees, 9 minutes, 17 seconds is 65.1547. Okay, same thing over here on this, uh, this other problem, 32 degrees, 0.479. We know it's 32 degrees. Now we take the fraction, sorry, the decimal that's left over, the excess, and we're going to say, okay, well, let's go figure out how many minutes come out of here. Well, every, sorry, I got this, this 0.49, we multiply by, by one degree. That one degree, we're going to substitute with the 60 minutes. And that's going to give us 28.74 minutes. So we have 32 degrees, 28 minutes, and then we have another fraction of a minute. 
we do the same thing again and let's take that frac that decimal part right there and let's take that by a second which is 60 seconds times this and now we get it a little more specific so the two problems just go two different ways some options you have okay questions on either of these examples and i'm sorry i don't have the chat open so if you guys are chatting something i, I got sarah sarai's um just holler out if, if i don't respond to a chat question immediately because i'm not seeing it as as often as i should here okay so arc length and you can see this first chapter is kind of a, a, a foundational chapter for the entire, you know, foundational section for the entire chapter six. A lot of formulas and definitions. And like I said, this entire PowerPoint is available um, to you. You can look at the same stuff that I have here. You just won't have me talking on it as much. So, oh, sorry, go back. The arc length. When we talk about an arc length, what is that? Well, here's a circle. If I have this right out here, that's the arc length we're talking about. Okay, that measurement, it's like if you got a ruler or tape measure is better and you just measured from this point all the way to this point, how long is that? That's gonna tell you what your arc length is. That's what they're talking about when they say arc length. So you see a formula, formula is not good enough. You have to know what does it actually stand for? What is it that we're talking about here? So find the arc length of a circle of radius four meters subtended by a central angle of 0.75 radian. All right, so this radians, and, and I, they, they haven't talked about this at all. So I'm gonna pause a little bit and kind of explain to you what radians are, because that's a major part of this semester here. All right. So when we talk about radians, we have degrees, which we've talked about, and then we have radians, which is your new one that you're gonna use a lot of. In the beginning, you're gonna see a little bit of both, but in time, it's gonna be all radians. All right, so degrees is one thing. I'll give you the easiest answer. 180 degrees is equal to, that's supposed to be pi, pi radians. So radians are always measured or usually measured in terms of pi, two pi, pi over two, pi over six, pi over three, all that stuff. The conversion is 180 degrees equals pi. So when I talk about 90 degrees, well, that's exactly half. That's going to be pi over two. When I have 135 degrees, well, that's not quite pi. It's more than it's in between them. And you'll see that's three quarters pi. Now, how do I get it? Very simple. If I have 135 degrees, the rule is, if you wanna convert, you multiply this by pi over 180 degrees. And what happens is, well, the degrees cancel off. You now have 135 Pi over 180 degrees, oh, 180, no more degrees, because I canceled off the degrees. And now you just reduce this fraction down, and that's how I get the three quarters pi. That's what they're talking about whenever they're converting one to the other. So when you convert from degrees to radians, which is mainly what you guys are gonna have to do, you'll do that. When you convert from radians to degrees, for example, let's say we have 5 pi over 6. This is in radians. So I'm going to tell you, hey, let's go from radians to degrees. Now, if you haven't figured out, radians and degrees, they're measuring the same amount, the same opening of an angle. It's like meters and feet, kilograms and pounds, you know, the metric system and the U.S. measurement system. You weigh the same whether you're in kilograms or pounds, you just have different numbers because they're different units of measurement. Radians and degrees are stating the same thing, they just use different types of measurements. So if I tell you you want you have five pi over six and you wanna com convert that to degrees, it's almost like the other formula I just showed you, but this time it's 180 over pi because the idea is I wanna have the pi cancel out. And then I have, I can make the six in this cancel to make it a 30. And now I have 150 degrees. 
150 degrees is the same as 5 pi over 6. Okay, that's that's the quick version of radians. We're going to do a lot more of that as, as time goes on, and I'm going to keep explaining this as we do more and more radians. So what happens is, on this problem, they're asking us to have this... Now, they're not asking you to actually convert it, but we're going to do it just for fun. They gave us 0.75. Now, they told us this is your radians, how many radians we have, okay? So it's 0.75 radians. Now, what you're going to notice is they don't always put the RAD or the radians. It's kind of just when you see no, nothing there, it's assumed it's radians. If it's degrees, you're going to see that little degree symbol. But the rule is, just like we did before, if I wanted to convert this, I'm going to multiply that by 180 degrees over pi. Now, this one is not going to come out nice and pretty. We have to actually use our calculator. And see if I can pop up the calculator right quick. And again, if you have a pi button on your calculator, go ahead and use that. Let me try this. Let me see if you can all see what I'm doing here. Okay, hopefully you're seeing both, right? Okay. So, I lost what I was writing, but remember, we I had 0.75 times the 180 degrees. Then I divide that by pi. And remember, you got a pi button right down here. Most calculators divide by pi, hit it. And basically that 0.75 is 42.97 degrees. That's how many degrees you have. So if you're wondering what the degrees were, that's what we're talking about right there. Okay, so back to this problem. You don't have to convert it. I just wanted to give you an idea of what in the world this 0.75 radians is. It's about 40 something degrees. So the nice part is you just gotta plug these two numbers into your formula right here. So remember the formula, where'd it go? S equals, the, the arc length is S. It equals the radius times the degrees. The, the key is the degree has to be in radians. You can't plug in 45 degrees here. It has to be in radians. So the radians is 0.75 the uh, radius is four, you simply just multiply the two and you get three meters. That's how long that arc length is. So remember that how arc length looks. It's like I have a circle. Remember we said it's like 40 something degrees. Uh, it's a little big, but let's just say it's that. This is four meters. This we have just found that length to be three meters. That's what the formula is telling us. So we don't have to do any of the drawing. You don't have to make a picture, but pictures don't hurt. It gives you a better understanding of what's going on. Okay, questions on that? That example, that formula, any of that stuff. Okay, so we get a revolution. Well, a revolution is like, like you know, you've dealt with a wheel, spinning a wheel around. If it goes one entire revolution, it's gone two pi radians. Because remember, one pi, sorry, one pi is 180 degrees, a circle's 360, so two pi is your complete circle, your complete revolution. All this on the bottom is what I talked about a second ago. One degree equals pi over 180 radians. One radian equals 180 over pi degrees. Those are your little formulas to convert them. So that's what we're doing right here, like I just did a second ago. Convert these angles to radians, well, 45 degrees is 45 times pi over 180. And the idea is that the 180 cancels with that right there. And you get pi over 4. 210. We're going to multiply that also by pi over 180. And we get 7 pi over 6 radians. And you see, what they're doing every time is we're just reducing the, the 210 over the 180. Knock off the 0. Divide 21 and 18 by 3. That's why they get the 7 pi over 6. And notice, don't make them decimals. Try to keep them as normal fractions. Don't plug in pi to your calculator. Don't plug in that and divide it by 4. We don't want decimals. We want to try to keep these as precise fraction measurements. So in the next one here, we have negative 60 degrees. It doesn't matter. You still do the same formula. Multiply by pi over 180, and you get negative pi over 3. 100 degrees, 
Reduce that down, it becomes 5 pi over 9. And you can do this for any of them, even if it doesn't reduce like this part E. They did go to a decimal here. You can leave it as 109 over 180. Um, judgment call. In this case, they just went to the, they just took the pi in the calculator, multiplied it by 109, divide it by 180, and this is how many radians they got. Okay. Um, just want to make sure one more thing. Okay. So now we're going backwards the other way. Here are the radians, and we're going to convert these to degrees. So it's the same formula, but it's upside down. Pi over 4, we want to convert that to degrees. We multiply by 180 over pi to make the pi's cancel off, and we're left with degrees. So it's 180 over 4, 45 degrees. And you can see it's the same kind of thing every time. Make the, degree, make the pi's cancel off. You're left with degrees. Reduce the fraction. Put it in your calculator, whatever the case, but get the 210 degrees. So I'll just kind of show these, and I'll... Paul, go back here. Sorry. Let's pause the screen right here. See if anybody has any questions on any of this here. Okay. So let's move on. Now, okay, let's get some of these word problems plugged in here. Find the, the field width of a DSLR camera lens. All right. So read this out here. And there's a couple things here. A cord is the, the length from one side to another in a circle connecting two points on a circle here. Um, so we want to approximate the field width of a scenery lens can image with a 400 millimeter camera lens and a distance of 725 feet if the viewing angle is 6 degrees 9 minutes. Picture is going to help us out a lot here. Okay, so look at all the stuff they talked about here. Here's the distance to your object, which you guys have done. You've taken pictures. This is the angle that you have. So... The measure of the central angle, that's six degrees, nine minutes, sorry. Remember the angle of four must be in radians. Remember, we're trying to figure out what this width is that we get right there, okay? So we have to convert that thing to radians. That's our first part, because remember, we're looking for the arc length. Let me go back to the problem here. They're asking us, approximate the fill, filled width, all right? So we know the formula to get this arc length right here. Now, if you look at it, the straight line, it's not that much different. Yeah, the arc length is a little bit bigger versus a straight line, the shortest distance right there, but they're pretty much close enough. So what we're going to use is our formula for the arc length. Remember that S equals R theta. And the key, as you see right here, is that formula, the, rate, the, uh, the theta, which is the angle measurement, has to be in radians. So we convert that six degrees, nine minutes. How do we do that? Well, first, do you guys remember how you get this 0.15? Nine minutes, take that, remember? The minutes is 60 minutes is a degree, so take this nine over 60, you put that in your calculator, you get this 0.15, so six degrees, nine minutes is 6.15 degrees. We want this because that's what we're gonna use to convert to radians. Take the 6.15, multiply it by pi, divide it by 180, and in our calculator, we get about 0.107. That's what we're going to plug into the formula that I just erased. We take that 0.107, um, and the radius, did they give us the radius? Go back to the problem. Yeah, 725 feet. So that's our radius. That's what we're going to plug in to the formula. The R is 725. The theta is 0.107. We just multiply them together, and we have an approximate width, that little cord there, that little arc length, 77.575 feet. And think about that. That's what you know when, if you're trying to take a picture. This is how wide you can get your picture. Okay, if, if, if that doesn't work, you have to back up a little more. We've all done this without actually measuring it, but it's the same process. If you shorten the radius up, you're going to get you know closer to your picture, your subject, but you're going to get less of a width that you can do. Okay, area of a sector. So when we talk about what a sector is, a sector is pretty much a pie slice. All right, so I'll show you what I mean here. That's your circle from this, assume that's my center right there. 
This right here is the sector that I'm talking about. All right, that little wedge, the pie slice. Now, you can't just use your normal formula of a triangle because this edge right here is curved. So we have a formula right here. Area of that wedge is one half the radius squared times the theta, the angle, the angle right here. But again, the angle has to be in radians. So here we have a sector that has a 45 degree angle. It has a radius circle of three. We just plug it into the formula. And oh yeah, first step, of course, convert that to radians. Because you can't plug in 45, you're going to get the wrong answer. Radians every time. So that is pi over 4 radians. And now we plug that into our formula. 1 half times the 3 squared times the pi over 4. And this is the precise area of this wedge right here. If it had a 45 degree angle and a width, uh, sorry, a radius of three, the area in there would be nine pi over eight. Now I know some of you are gonna say, why don't we make that into a decimal? It depends on what the problem is. Generally, you don't wanna make it a decimal. You wanna leave this thing as a fraction um, just because it's the precise area. If you go to a calculator and you plug it in and you divide a nine times pi divided by eight, it's gonna be a decimal that goes on forever and then you're going to have to cut it off at some point and round it. And when you do that, you've lost a little bit of your answer. You've lost a little bit. So you have to make sure, um, keep it here precise, unless they tell you, oh, round it to two decimal places, like this right here. If they say round to two decimal places or round to one decimal place or three, that's your go ahead to go ahead and plug it into a calculator. So this is the precise answer, which is going to be asked for sometimes. Other times they're going to say, let's get the... Uh, um, two decimal places. So you see they already have the answer right there, that 3.53. Let me just show you on the calculator to make sure you know what I'm talking about. And remember, your phones should all have a calculator. You have an iPhone, I know, for example, you don't have all these buttons, but if you turn your iPhones, if you're on the calculator, you turn it sideways, then you're going to get all of these buttons, these functions, because some of these you're going to use, especially these trig buttons later on in the class right here at the bottom. So all I'm taking is I'm taking the 9, multiplying it by pi equals, divided by 8, and that's where they get that 3.53, just so you know where they got this from, okay? All right, so let's look at the next piece. So there's your area, 3.53 square meters. Uh, linear speeds, I think our last topic here. Another formula, the V is going to be your velocity. It's going to be... How fast is something spinning around? Okay, so suppose an object moves on a circle. So it's like something is, you know, a point right here and it's moving around. They want to know how fast is it? Okay, the circle has a radius r. It's a constant speed. If s is the distance traveled and t is the time. So you might have heard that distance equals rate times time rate equals distance over time. It's the same kind of concept here is how much have you covered? Your S is your distance covered in amount of time. That's going to be your linear speed. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, there's a lot of letters here that are going to come up. Well, the good news is you get to write these down. I would suggest having a little, a little note card, a cheat sheet out with you. So when you're doing your homework, when you're doing the quiz, you can pull these up quickly instead of having to dig through your notes or the book or the the PowerPoint slides. So the angular speed is this Greek letter omega. Now it doesn't look like an omega, but notice they tell you it's a lowercase omega. So normal omega, remember, looks like this. This W looking thing, that's the lowercase omega in Greek letters. So the angular speed is how fast something is moving on the inside, how fast an angle is changing. So it's again the amount of the angle that's moved over a certain amount of time. All right, so then we have a velocity over here. That's the angular speed. This is the velocity. A couple other formulas. Let me clear the screen here for a second. Okay, child is spinning a rock at the end of a two foot rope at a rate of 180 revolutions per minute. Find the linear speed of the rock when it is released. Okay, now before we do the problem, let me kind of show you a reminder here. You, you've all been on, I hope, at some point, you've been on like a merry-go-round that's spinning around, okay? 
and this thing is spinning in this direction and it's going somebody's somebody's running on the outside or, and pulling it or pushing it and, and you're getting speed you guys see why the radius matters because if you put your head back here you all know you're moving fast you're moving far if you put your head in the middle you're only moving a little bit. It's not as nerve-wracking. It's not as crazy. So the further out you are, because this thing is spinning at a certain speed, no matter where you're positioned, it's moving around. But the further out you are, the more distance you're traveling in one revolution. So that's why it feels more intense the further out you are. That's why the radius is such an important uh, concept. Uh, for, uh, you know, It's an important part of these formulas. You have to know how far apart, how far apart out it is. I'm sorry, not apart, how far out it is, because that's going to increase the speed the further out it is. So we have this kid spinning a two foot, uh, you know, the rope is two feet long. It's spinning around and 180 revolutions per minute. Find the linear speed of the rock when it's released. So, sorry, let's get some ideas here. All right, so let's get. Two feet, the angular speed is what they want to get first. Okay, so they asked to find the linear speed, but we're going to get the angular speed from that formula we just did right now. So go back here. Remember the angular speed? It's the number of the angle in radians divided by the amount of time. So how do we find that out? Remember this 180 revolutions we talked about earlier? One revolution is one complete circle so it's 360 degrees but in radians it's 2 pi so one revolution is 2 pi 180 revolutions is basically 360 pi so that's what we have going on here we have 180 revolutions times 2 there's my 100 there's my 360 pi that we're talking about and then how many minutes did we do this for well, it's revolutions per minute. It's per one minute. So, oh, go back. So we have 360 pi radians per minute. That's how many radians we're traveling in one minute. So that's the, the, uh, the angular speed. Next, we're going to do the linear speed. We have to figure out what's happening here. So how do we do that? Well, remember, there's that last formula they put on there. The linear speed V is the radius times the angular speed. Well, we just found the angular speed to be 360 pi. We know the radius is 2. So 720 feet per minute is how fast this ball is going or this rock, whatever's at the end there. All right. And then, of course, if you multiply 720 times pi, 3.14, you get approximately 2,000 plus feet per minute is how fast that thing is going. Or... 25 miles per hour. Pretty fast. Okay, so that's it for the lecture part. What I want to spend the last part of class is let's just go over some problems. Let's, let's look at your homework, show you how things are going to go, make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of this. So, again, back to your course here. Okay, so... Here's our 127, and so you see your assignments right here. All right, syllabus quiz, and okay. So I wanted to just show it from your end here. Okay, so this is what you're gonna see when you go in. Once you finish the syllabus quiz, we got 59 questions, okay? It's a lot, but spread this out over a few days, it's not so bad. So what I'm gonna try to do here, as many as I can here, I'm just gonna go through every four. I, that's usually what I like to do, is I'll just do, I'll start with number three, I'll do number three, number seven, number 11, 15, all the way down this third column here, just to give you a taste of everything. What to expect, how this stuff works, and especially how they want the answer to be stated. Because sometimes you may have it, but you're not too sure. So. An angle theta is in blank blank if it's vertex. You remember that? That was in standard position. So some of this is, see these are going to be real quick. No big deal. Okay, now I'm going to get some of these wrong. Just go ahead. Uh, let me get your question, Leslie. I'm sorry. 
Oh, yes. Get, uh, I believe the 18, there's an 18 week code in the bookstore or there's a one year access code. The one year access code is more, if you guys were in math 126 and I'm telling you to buy Pearson, then I'd say buy the full year so you can use it for the next course. But since this is all you need, I would get the, the smaller one, get the 18 week. And, and I'd tell you the same thing if this is a regular semester course, 18 is all you need. So get the 18 week access code if that's an option for you. Okay. All right. So uh, where are we at here? Let me jump to number seven. So you see these first couple of problems. I'm just going to skip past them, but they're just asking you basic definitions and here. 180 degrees is how many radians? Okay, so let's pretend I don't know. And I said, oh yeah, I think that's that's pi over two. And when you do your check, it's gonna tell you it's wrong. And you see, it's gonna give you some feedback. Sometimes it's gonna tell you the answer. Sometimes it's going to give you a hint. Then you can try again. So your problem was wrong at this point, but let me, let me show you. So if I'm looking at this assignment right here, Ah, uh, sorry, hit the wrong thing. Let me come right back. Okay, homework one. So you see, this is kind of your checklist. I got this one right. I got this one wrong. I haven't done any of the other ones yet. And so I can go back. I'm still on number seven. So when they're calculating your grade right now, you have a 1.69%. And remember, we need to reach a, a, a higher score. Or it says right here, you need an 80%. And I, sometimes I do have a, a, a lower score because I don't want to kill you guys on too much time. I encourage you to get every one of these done because your quiz is essentially going to be five or ten problems right out of your homework. So if you only get through half, you may get to take the quiz, but you're going to have no idea how to do half the quiz. And the quiz is what counts. So right now that number seven is wrong, as you can see. So I did a try again and I can see it and say, let's try this again. Oh, yeah. 180 degrees is pi. Now I can check it again, and now I have it right, okay? And it's this other sheet might take a couple minutes to update, but it will, it's counted, it's gonna be right. So let's look at number 11. Okay, so draw the angle. Now remember, 120 degrees. 90 degrees is every little clump. So 90 degrees is up, 180 degrees is over to here, and a 120, a regular 120 would be right around here. Okay, this one of these looks like a 120. This is close to a 120, but because it's a negative 120, remember we have to go clockwise. We're going down. So this is negative 90 right down to here. Negative 120 is a little bit past. Out of all the ones, this is my only choice. Now again, let's just say I'm not paying attention or I did it wrong and I check and I got it wrong. It's going to tell you some hints. It's not going to tell you the answer this time, but it's going to tell you what's going on, what a re revolution is. And that's a little bit of a hint, but maybe that, that didn't help me. And I do it again. And now they tell you the answer is B, you answer C. So what happens is at this point, I can't do the problem again. I'm done. The problem's wrong and that's going to hurt my score. But I have this button down here for similar question. So it told me what I did wrong. So let me hit similar question. And what it does is it resets it. It gives me another shot. So it threw away the bad one. It's like I get to retake it. Now let me try to find negative 60. And sometimes it gives you one try. Sometimes it gives you two or three. Um, you just have to kind of look at what the bottom button is telling you. But now I get it right. And now it doesn't even have a record of me getting that number 11 wrong. It's replaced it with the correct one. So as you do your homework, if you've got some of these that are incorrect, don't be afraid to go back and say, okay, I'm going to clean up these ones I got wrong. I'm going to hit that similar exercise button and do it again. And that'll make your score go up to what the desired one is. Now we're in radians. Again, we got to find a picture. And this, all these exercises are good to help you get an idea of what's going on. So forget the negative, but remember pi over 2. Pi is 180. Pi over 2 is half of that, which is 90 degrees. So we know 90 degrees is up here. But when it's negative 90, it's got to go down. So let's just say, oh, I forgot to see it was a 90, negative, And I click that. It's going to tell me. And it's going to remind you of the negative right there. Oh, yeah. It should be down here. And now I have it right. Okay. So I don't mean to run through these quickly. So I want to make sure. Is everyone okay with 
what I'm doing. Any questions on any of these? Okay, don't be shy. Like I said, I'm here to answer any, any questions you guys have. All right, 225 degrees. We want to convert this to radians. So my approach, how I would do this, if you can't do it in your head, you're not expected to. If I want to make this into radians, the rule is I take this and I multiply, oops, sorry, by pi over 180. How I know if I want radians, I have a pi on top. If I want degrees, I have the degrees on top. That's what tells you which of these two to pick. And you also know because the degrees cancel off. So I have 225 pi over 180. And then now you can just reduce this down. I can divide both top and bottom by 45 and it looks like I get five pi over four. And now you have to, some of these are not gonna be multiple choice as you can tell. You gotta get used to this format right here. If I do a fraction, now I can hit this button so it gives me a fraction to type in two things. Or I can just simply say five pi and hit the slash button and it makes a fraction just like that. So play around this, that's what the homework is for. You're gonna see things that you're gonna wonder, well, is it this or this, do they want this? Give your best guess, and if it's wrong, well, you get a chance to correct it, but you don't wanna be figuring things, oh, what did I do wrong here? Oh, sorry, let's go back. I wrote the problem wrong. <laughs> 255, not 225, gotta. Make sure I write my problems correctly. Sorry about that. Let's do this again. Okay, one more time. So 255 degrees is what we have. So this is 255 pi over 180. So now I'm going to reduce this down. Let's just divide these by 5 each. And you see I'm just doing good old reducing of fractions like we've done before. Oops, sorry about that. Okay. So get the calculator out and just show you what I'm talking about. Again, I don't expect you to do these in your head. 255 I know is divisible by five. I get a 51. 180 I can divide that by five. And it's a 36. Now I can divide them both by three. And that's going to be 17 pi over 12. And I think that is what the answer is that I'm supposed to have. Now again, it told me I was wrong. It's good to make mistakes in your homework. It's the quiz that you want to try to get it perfect. And let's cross our fingers and see. Yep, now we're done on that one. So that one was just a, a screw up on my part. I just read that problem wrong. But either way, it's the same process. It does not matter what these degrees are. You will do the same thing every time. Questions on this before I erase it? Okay, so let's look at number 23 while we're here. Okay, convert negative 270 to radians. Well, same process. If I want to make it radians, I'm going to multiply by pi over 180 degrees. That makes these cancel. Now I have negative and you'll be starting to do these in your head even faster. You don't have to write some of these steps. But if I divide these both by 9, I get negative 3 pi over 2. And that's your answer. And, and notice, they're going to try to be. I'm not going to say they're going to do this every time. But it tells you in parentheses right here. This is the instruction. Simplify your answer. Type an exact answer. So when you hear exact answer, don't give a decimal. Don't go to your calculator. In terms of pi, they want to see this negative 3 pi over 2. And we get the well done. Okay. In other problems, they may say round your answer to the nearest two decimal places. Then you would do that. All right. Questions on number 23. All right. Let's look at number 27. Okay, 
So in this case here, we have convert this angle two degrees. So we're going the other way. And these exercises, like I said, when you see a lot of the same problem, there is a reason for it. It's because you got to know how to do this and do it well. So in this case, I'm going to multiply by 180 degrees over pi. The pi's cancel, the 20 and the uh, 90 and the 180 cancel and they leave me with 9 degrees. Doesn't seem right, but let's plug it in. And some of you may wonder, okay, well where is the degrees? You'll find the degrees if you look, but you see it's already right here. They already have the degrees. So when they when and this is what you have to look at. Oh, it's already got the degrees. I just need to put the numerical value in there. That's all you have to do. Okay? I've seen it where you know, it'll have degrees and then somebody types in nine degrees here, which is correct, but the computer's gonna mark it wrong because they only want the nine. Gotta look at your problem because sometimes they're gonna want the whole thing, sometimes they're gonna want just this. Look and see what they want. Any questions on number 27? Okay, let's look at number 31. And you see how a lot of these are quick. So it's 59 problems, but a lot of these are very quick answers. You just have to know how to do them. And they will, of course, get progressively harder. They're going to see it more and more. But my idea here for each lecture is I just want to get you guys used to the process and what I'm expecting and what's expected to be done when you're looking at these different problems. So here we have negative 64 degrees. We want to convert that to radians. So I multiply by pi over 180. The degrees cancel. And I have negative, let me just say I divide this by 2. And then I can divide it by 2 again. And then I believe that's as far as I can go. Always check. And they, now on this time now, they want an integer or decimal. So if I was to put this, now sometimes if you type in the precise answer like I'm doing, if I can find the pi. So if I did this, Okay, this is the precise answer. I believe they're going to check it correct. They might, they might not. But if they say go to a, a decimal run to do decimal places, that's what you want to plug in. Okay, so yeah, they didn't take it right. And this is why like I said I like to do this on the homework when it doesn't count. Now let's go to our calculator and get this right. So if you know you're going to a calculator, the good news is I didn't have to do any of this reduction stuff. I could have gone to this original answer, this 64 divided by 180 and multiply that by pi, and I would have got this negative 1.12. Now notice, let's get that calculator back on the screen. They want this to be to the two decimal places. So remember, the, the third one tells you to round up or down. That's why it has to be 1.12. And of course, it's negative. Now, if I took this answer that I had a second ago and I took the 16 divided, or multiply by pi divided by 45, I should be getting the same thing. And I do. Okay, and as long as I've done everything correct, we're good. Any questions on how I did number 31 here? Okay, let's look at 35. Okay, 35, convert the angle in radians to degrees. So, the weird one here is, remember, it doesn't have the pi. Usually, radians have pi's. Sometimes, they don't. They don't have to. In this case, it doesn't matter. If you want to make it into degrees, just tell yourself, I have to have that 180 degrees on top. Okay, and now your problem is saying... Let's go to the nearest decimal place. That, that's your permission to use a calculator right here. So I'm going to take that 3.28. I'm going to multiply it by the 180. And then last, divide it by pi. And now I have this 187.9. And they say, what, round to the nearest two decimal places. So... 187.93. A lot of people have the inclination to say, oh, I see a 9, I want to make it a 188. Well, not if that's what, where they told you to 
They told you to go to a different decimal place, but here's what we have. Okay, question, and that was all calculator. Any questions on how I did that one? All right, let's look at number 39. All right, now we're going to make this into degrees, minutes, and seconds. So we have the, where is it, 51.34 degrees. So they want to separate degrees, minutes, and seconds. Well, we already have the 51 degrees right there. And then we have this leftover piece like that, okay? So what you have to remember is, and you saw how the example was, a degree is essentially one sixtieth, uh, sorry, wrong way. A degree is 60 minutes, not one sixtieth. 60 minutes for that one degree right there. So I'm gonna take my calculator just for that decimal part. Remember the, the uh, the 51 degrees is already spoken for. We don't have to mess with that. It's how we clean up the, the part of a degree. We take that 0.34, multiply it by 60, and we get 20.4. So this is 20.4 minutes. So here's what we have so far. We have our 51 degrees, and now we have 20 minutes. We just have this 0.4 minutes we have to deal with, and it's the same way. Well. That is the same as 60 seconds. So I take this 0.4, multiply it by 60, and I get 24 seconds. And even if this comes out to be a decimal, that would be the end of what you'd have to do. So we type in our 51, we type in our 20, we type in our 24, and we get our fantastic. Any questions, any of you, about this weird one going to, from degrees with a decimal to degrees, minutes, and seconds. Like I said, the homework, I consider that to be your main way to learn this stuff. So when you're doing these problems, don't, don't be mad or don't be frustrated if you're getting them wrong. This is how you learn them. So even if you look at this and say, I don't know what to do, go plug in some numbers, get it wrong, and see the hints. Go back and watch a video. Go back and look at an example. And I'm going to do that on the next problem here. I'll show you what I mean. So let's look at 43. All right. S denotes the length of the arc of a circle. And we have all this stuff right here. We have to remember, well, how do I do this? I don't remember. I know there's a formula. And I'm looking through my notes, and I don't remember it. What do I do? Well. Here's a hint, there's two. There's a couple of things down here. You can click this and go right to your textbook. So this'll, this'll pull it up and it takes a second, but it'll get up there. And it takes you right to the section, and so you can kind of scroll through here if you want to do that, okay? Then there's view an example. And this is one of my favorite ones because what it does is you see, it's a different problem. We have a quarter radian, they have one seventh radian. We have two feet, well, they have two feet also, but it's gonna walk you through the steps. Okay, so it's the same problem. You see here, we wanna find the radius. Begin by solving the equation S equals R theta. So this is something, hey, I forgot this. Okay, now we got it, the hint, the other problem. So then they show you the formula. They plug in S over theta. What they do is they divide both sides by theta to get the R by itself. So we know that R equals the two, which is the, uh, the S, the arc length, Divide it by the 1 7th, which is our radians. Reduce it down, we get 14 feet, and we're done. Now I can hopefully use it. If at worst case I can't do it, I can have them solve mine. So they'll help us, and they'll do it the same way. Now the difference is, when you go through this process, okay, they make us do this, S over theta, and they're kind of making you do the steps. And then, okay, what's the next step? Now we plug this in. I think this comes out to be one fourth divided by, sorry, two divided by one fourth gives me an eight. And I check my answer and I'm good. Now here's the problem. When I'm done, <laughs> I don't get to do that same problem. That was like a practice because they helped us. So they regenerate and give you a new one. So if you do the help me solve this, you're gonna have to do a different problem. So my recommendation is hit the view example which shows you a different problem, and then you get to do yours. 
Either way, it's the same amount of work, but now I've done this kind of two times and I think I know what I'm doing. R equals S theta. Is that right? What do you guys think? And if you have to, like I said, you can view the example and say, oh no, it's S equals R theta. It's an easy fix. Okay, but this is what we have to, this is where you're learning this stuff from. And like I always tell my students, it, it's good to get them wrong because that's how you learn. All right, you don't really learn it when you're always getting it right. Um, my example I'll say is, you know, we all have GPS. We all know how to get to directions. We go from, from one place to another. But if you're going to a new location and you're doing your GPS, you're going to be relying on that GPS for a long time. But if one time you just decide, the first time you decide, let me just try to figure this out on my own without a GPS, you're going to make some wrong turns. You're going to hit some dead ends. You're going to take 30 minutes longer, maybe 10 minutes longer. But the good news is you will never forget where that place is. You will always remember where that location is and you're never going to need your GPS again. So that's my example here is don't be afraid to just do this on your own and get it wrong. And if you get it wrong, you'll be okay. So remember the process. We plug in the 7 for the that. We plug in the 1 half for the theta. And now it looks like R is 14. That, I believe, will be our radius. And we have it. So it just takes a couple more ste steps to do if you forgot how to do a problem. But you're never going to be just hung out to dry here on these problems. You know, when we get to the linear velocity, the angular velocity in a second, we're gonna, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to show you guys how you would do it or how I would do it if I was a student who didn't remember the formulas. Look at 47. Find the radius of a circle who has a sector area of 3 square meters. So remember how that is. We have a circle. We have a sector right here. So they told us the area is 3 square meters. It has a central angle right here. The angle is 1 fourth radian. And they're asking, find the radius. Well, if you're sitting there going, I don't remember the formula, hit the view example. Okay. And what do you know? There's my area right there. And I'm just kind of, I'm kind of writing this as I'm going. I'm going to use their example to help me get this. And I can say, well, oh, you know what? I think I got it. I'll just close that example and I'll start plugging things in here and say, okay, there's my area, which is three. The radius, I don't know. The theta is one fourth. Now you may look at that and say, this seems kind of complicated. I don't know if that's right. Hit the view example again. It's going to show you the same thing. And you see what they did was they kind of went and solved for R. So they have a square root. So that just kind of told me that I know I'm in the right, you know, procedure. All right. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do this a little bit slightly differently than what the example would be. I'm going to multiply the one half and the one fourth to get the one eighth. I'm going to multiply both sides by eight to get the R square. And now I'm going to take the square root of that 24. And now is where we got to look at how do they want the answer to be. If they want an exact answer, I go with that 2 square root of 6. I pull the 4 out. But they said, oh no, go give me a decimal, three decimal places. That means I didn't have to do that thing I just wrote, that the 2 square root of 6. I'm going to take that 24. And I'm going to take the square root of that. And I get this 4.8989. And now they want three decimal places. So 4.898, but the next nine tells me round up, so it should be 4.899. And that's an important step because you will get these wrong if you round incorrectly. Question on 47. Okay, a couple more and then we'll be done for the day. Let's, and again, the whole idea here is I'm just trying to get you guys to see exactly how these problems are done you know it's it's not as good as me sitting there at, at a table helping you do every problem but at least i can help you with a quarter of these and you can kind of see how they they should work okay and, and like i said I, I like to simulate what it'll be like in real life where i know these formulas but you just learned them so it's not, you're not expected to memorize these right now or know what goes where that's where those help features at the bottom of the screen are really going to come into handy so we didn't have to use them, you know, in the beginning of this homework, but now as these problems start to ramp up, 
we have to, you know, we have to do a little bit more. We need a little more help. That's how I look at it. Okay. So here they say, find the length S in area A. And I'm like, what is it up? Oh yeah, it's over here. The picture's way over here. Okay. So we, it looks like we have 70 degrees as my inside angle. I don't know the area, but I know the 13 yards. Well, I remembered a second ago, we had that area of a sector formula. It was a one half R squared theta, something like that. The S formula was something like an R theta. This is what I would tell you to do. Try to write down your formulas. See if those are the right ones. And then if you need to, let's peek now. Don't just peek right in the beginning. Try to do it on your own like I did just now. So I'm guessing at these formulas from a second ago. Well, let's see here. Okay, sure enough, here's the, the formula for the uh, arc length. I had that S equals R theta. And then it goes and figures that one out. Now we look at, I had to do a little bit of converting, so I'm looking at that. Now I'm just trying to jump to the other half of this problem. Where is it? Oh yeah, the area of a sector, there's my A equals one half R square theta. Okay, so like I said, I'm peaking, but I'm not gonna let that be the only thing, you know, telling me what to do here. So let's go find this area of the sector, or sorry, so let's find the arc length first, because that's the first thing they asked for down here. So the radius is 13. The theta is 70 degrees. Now, I'm, gonna do, I'm doing this on purpose. Some of you are already looking at it going, wait a minute, you're doing it wrong. Okay. Now, if I type in this 910, I already know I'm going to get it wrong. I want to see if you guys understand why. And they give you a hint what I did wrong here. Since theta must be in radians, first convert the 70 degrees of radians. Notice I didn't do that. I just plugged in the 70 degrees. So, and that's a very typical mistake. That's why I did this, because I wanted you to see what a lot of you may do and realize, oh yeah, I messed up. This is not the right thing. I have to take the 70 degrees and make it a radian measurement first, which we just got done doing. Remember pi over 180? Now, I'm looking ahead and I already know my answer has to be three decimal places, so I don't have to get fancy and reduce this thing down. I'm just gonna go in my calculator and go right here with the 70 and the 180. So I have 70 times pi equals divided by 180, and I get this 122 and all this, 1.22. Now, while I'm at the very end of my problem, it says round to the nearest, sorry, round to three decimal places. It, while you're working on the problem, though, you want to go a little further. Okay, it's the very end. So I'm going to keep it here because I may have to multiply this, divide this, square it, whatever. And if I round too much, it's going to mess up my answer. So it never hurts to go a little extra, and that's what I've done here. So now I'm going to say S is 13 times all this. And what's good is I already have this number on my screen. I'm going to leave it there. And I'm just going to take that answer and multiply it by 13. And I get this. Now this is my final answer for S. This is what I'm going to round the nearest three decimal places. Okay. And there is the first part. And Jason, your question was, are the quiz questions similar to the homework questions? They are exactly the same questions as in let me let me clarify sorry these are all pulled from the same test bank of questions so when i pick your homework i'm picking a bunch of questions out of there's like 100 questions or 200 questions for section 6.1 when i make create this homework i just pick certain ones when i pick the quiz i pick even fewer out of that same pool so they're all out of the same pool so you may see this this number 51 you may see the exact same one on your quiz or you see may see number 50 or maybe Jason you get number 51 and someone else gets number 52 it's it's kind of a randomization thing so it's very similar if not the exact ones okay um any questions on this first part before I clear this one okay so let, let's look at the area of the sector and remember the area is the one half 
times the radius, which we saw was 13 squared, times the theta. And remember the theta is that decimal that goes on forever. We already converted this. So that's the good news. We already converted it. So now I'm going to take 13 squared divided by 2 multiplied by 1.22173. And we get this answer. And that hopefully is the area. And we're good. So that's all it is. A couple hmm. steps. Sometimes you have to convert. You have to know your formulas. When do I use the theta? When does it have to be a rating, I should say? Okay. Hmm. So let's see what number 55 has for us. And again, I'm going to, you know, do that same trick where I'm going to use that help me to, to clarify this. If it's not, you know, if I'm not sure, I'm going to go ahead and use that here. So the total arm of a blade of a windshield, windshield wiper is 11 inches, as you see here on the picture. Rotates back and forth for an 89 degree angle. The shaded region in the figure is the part that gets cleaned by the 9 inch Wiper blade. All right. Now, this is a little extra tricky here because what happens is nine inches is the blade. As you see on your winter wipers, it doesn't clean this part here that's in white. It's this gray part. So we got to figure out how we clean this. So I'm not going to look at that. Find my friends or sorry, the uh, view an example here, but let's just show you the same formula. Remember the area of a circle. Uh, sorry, sector. Notice I'm writing this down every single time reason I'm writing this down is the more I write it, the more it's in my head. This is like the fourth, fifth time I've written it today. So now it's like I'm not even thinking about it. I already know I'm associating the area of a sector to this formula right here. Now, if I was to plug this in, and first let's do this. The theta is 89 degrees. And as you recall from before, we need to convert this to radians. Okay, so same old song and dance. I've written this 180 over pi a number of times because this has been done a lot. And, and then the more you write it, it's got to tell you a couple things. That means it's probably important because it comes up so often. And the more you write it, the more it's going to become like muscle memory, second nature. All right, so we have 1.553344. Radians. So that's what I'm going to use over here. Now I'm going to leave this on my calculator because I'm going to use that in a second. All right. So back to what we're doing here on the left. It's a half. If I plug in the 11 times this 1.553343, that's going to give me the area of the entire sector, including this little white spot. Okay, so I'll show you how that's going to be. I'm leaving this in my screen so I don't have to use it again. I'm going to divide this by 2. That's the half. And I'm going to multiply that by 11. And then multiply 11 again. Or if you knew the 121, you could have done that. So the area of the big wedge of all of it is 93.9772535. 6... Like I said, I'm going to go a little further, even though it says to the nearest tenth. I always like to go further because just in case. Now, what happens is that's too big. That's everything. I got to get rid of this part. So how we get rid of the little, the missing area, it's also a sector. So it's going to have this same formula here. But the difference is the radius of this little tiny bit is two. Okay, everyone see why it's 2? This is 9. From here to here is 9. From here to here is 311. So that's the little bit that you have, the little tiny wedge. That sector has a radius of 2. Okay, now, you don't have to do this, but I'm going back to the beginning when I converted that 89 degrees. Just to get this 1.55, the whole decimal up here. That's what I'm plugging in right here. So I'm going to divide that by 2. 
and multiply it by two squared, which is four. So the little wedge, oops, the small one is 3.106686. So basically, I have to subtract those two numbers to figure out what the answer is going to be. I'm getting about 90.87, rounded to the nearest hole should be 90.9. .9. Let's get that back up here. Oh, sorry, rounded to the nearest tenth is what they said, right? Yeah, nearest tenth, we get a 90.9. .9. And there it is. Any questions? All right, I'm going to make you guys talk next class. I know the first day you're not going to be chatting too much, but I'm going to start asking a little bit just because I want to make sure you're getting everything I'm saying here. Don't worry today. You guys are good. Let's look at number 59. Two pulleys, one with radius R, one with radius R2. R1 and R2 are connected by a belt. The pulley of the radius 1 rotates at omega revolutions per minute, whereas pulley two rotates at omega two revolutions per minute. Show that the radius one or radius two equals all that. Now, they tell you, let the two velocities be the linear speeds of the pulleys. Let theta one and theta two be the central angles that are swept out in time. Radius one and radius two respectively Determine the approximate equations for V1 and V2. Okay, so this is going to be a fun one. It's going to take a while here, but let us let me start this off. And I'm going to tell you, if you guys come up short on this one, don't get frustrated. This is not going to be one I'm going to give you on the quiz. At least I can tell you that right now. You won't get this ugly one. Um, it's And you'll see, I, I like to do this on the homework. I'm going to throw a couple of what I call challenge problems in here at the end, just to see if you can come up with it. Now, you might already notice the one bad thing is there's no help me with this one. We got to do this all on our own. Okay, so let's just kind of work through this and see what we get here. So what, what this top part is telling you is that if you have two different circles with different radius, radii, oops, sorry, and they're connected with a belt, basically goes all the way around like that. Okay, like a bike chain or a belt of any kind of device here. Um, so you have, as they're turning here, obviously this one has one radius, radius one. This one has radius two. They're obviously different in my picture here. And when they spin, you know, again, if you ever looked at that bicycle, this is where you're pedaling right here. As you pedal on one, it does not mean the other one's turning at the same speed. They are turning at different speeds, okay? That's the whole point of pulleys and gears and systems like this is you can turn one and it because of the size of the wheel, it's going to make another one turn a lot faster or a lot slower depending on what's going on. So this one has omega one. This one has omega two. That's the speed that's going around. So if you look at our formulas here, all right, remember now they, they gave us a couple of those formulas here. I wanted to pull up the PowerPoint just to show you from there. Okay, so remember when I was drawing on this, where are we at here? And, and this, is, this is what we're going to be using, the same kind of idea right here. But go back to this slide right there. Okay, so... If you look at the diameter, because that's what's going on here with, you know, the angles, I'm sorry, the angular speed here is the number of degrees that happen in a certain amount of time, all right? It's how much is turning. But the way these are connected, they're connected on their outside chains. They're connected essentially with the diameter of the circle. That's the part that's, that's being connected to everything. So you're getting a bigger speed on some. So look at that formula. Let me just put that right here. Your omega equals theta over t. Now, what I'm trying to show you, and this is going to be a little bit of a, a work right here. They're trying to tell you that you have a, this is an inverse proportion. 
okay? So if you look at these right here, whatever the radius is compared to this one, now I made the R1 be the smaller one. I didn't say that, but I'm just gonna make it be the smaller one. Whatever that ratio is, the speeds of the two wheels are gonna be in reverse. So let me give you an example. <laughs> Excuse me. If, and again, I'm making these numbers up, so don't take these, you know, as the facts. Let's just say the wheels were twice as big, like radius two was twice as big. What would happen is the speeds would be the same, but the speed of the bigger wheel will be only one and the little wheel, wheel will be two, okay? Because you, you have to spin the bigger wheel twice as fast to get around to match up to that. So that's what they're saying right there, okay? So they want us to look at these linear speeds here and of uh, the pulleys. So remember again, linear speed, we talked about this right here. Oh, not that one. Uh, where'd it go? Right there, okay. Remember linear speed? I'm just trying to keep this in the bottom of the screen. This V equals S over T. Now this is the part where it gets confusing. So I'm trying to show it to you like you guys would be doing this because I've thrown a lot of questions at you. I've thrown a lot of formulas at you. Formulas are not important. What matters is what do the letters represent? V is the linear speed. T is time. S, what's S? Remember S was that arc length. They said it here, I think. The distance traveled time on the circle. Essentially, it's the arc length right there. So we're trying to come up with representations. Let me get rid of the PowerPoint here. So let V1 and V2 be the linear speeds of the pulleys, all right? That's how fast this is turning. A point on this wheel is going at a certain speed. That's V1. A point on this big circle is turning at a certain speed. That's going to be the V2. So what it is, is like, well, how far do you go on the arc? What distance does this point cover in a certain amount of time versus a point on this wheel in a certain amount of time? Okay, so, okay, we have theta one, theta two, be the central angle swept out in time for time T pulleys. And I'm trying to, oh, they want us to come up with the equations of these. Okay, so remember the formula for arc length, all right? Remember S equals R theta. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, we have this being the same formula. Remember the arc length formula was r theta? So if I know for the first wheel, it has radius one, it has a theta one, a certain angle over a certain amount of time, that's gonna be the formula that I wanna plug in. Now this is gonna be not as easy as well. I type in r, how do you do a sub one? It's this little dot, it's this piece right here. So you type in the R, you type that, there's the R1, and then you tab it, So because if I didn't tab this, the next thing would be a theta, see down there at the bottom, it's only gotta be a one there. So hit a tab, now you hit the theta, sub one, and all of that, yep. And let me try that again, let's do the fraction first. R sub one, Theta sub one all over time. That should equal the formula for the first velocity. And this one should just be R two and theta two. Now I'm not sure if that's exactly what they want. I'm gonna check it. And they didn't like that, okay. Might not have been that one. Like I said, I'm not gonna give you this one on the quiz, but it's it's the challenge problem that I just threw out here to get you guys to look at this a little bit. Um, I'm guessing they want us to put this in. And this is one of my complaints I'm gonna say about my math lab at times. The clarity is not always there um, in what they want or you know, what they're asking for here. 
So I'm trying to just see what's the best way to talk about this. Because I don't know what, you know, my answer is right, but that's not what they're looking for is what I'm getting at. So let me pause here for a second. I may have to just give you a better answer to this next time. If you get to number 59 here before Wednesday, don't worry about it. Just skip it. Even if you get it wrong, don't worry about it. And then um, we'll talk about this as the first thing on Wednesday, just so that I don't waste I don't want to make you guys sit here while I'm thinking about this problem. Uh, any questions in general for any of you? You get what's going on in the homework. You get what they're asking, except for this number 59. But the rest of them, you get the idea of what's happening. Do the homework one, then do the quiz one, then do homework two and do quiz two. Okay, the big thing is get signed up, get the syllabus quiz done, get the homework one done, get the quiz one done, and you're going to be set. Uh, Kenneth, the course ID, <clears throat> I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's, uh, let me tell you. It's this right here. Villa 31557. That's our course ID. Other questions from anybody else? You may think of some more tonight, tomorrow. Email me or come ask me on Wednesday when we meet in class. Um, again, we're going to be here at the same link every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at noon. Uh, I know we're over time here, so I'll, I'll start up with this number 59 question for you all, and then we'll... We'll move on to some lectures out of 6.2 and 6.3 and get you on your way for the next part. All right. Well, if you don't have anything else, you're welcome to go. Take off and start on your work. Have a good one as well. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to stick around. And you can talk to me if you want, you know, when everyone's gone. Up to you. I'll stick around for a couple minutes. If not, have a good day.